The Real Reason God Created You The truth is, many woke up with this burning question on their minds. Why am I here? This age-old question has been the driving force behind countless discussions, artistic expressions, and personal reflections. But what if... The answers to this profound inquiry were already written thousands of years ago. The Bible, one of the world's oldest and most revered texts, provides insights into understanding our existence. In the beginning, God declared, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 this statement alone points to the intrinsic value and purpose of every individual. We were not merely an afterthought or an accident. We were crafted in the image of God. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 further illustrates God's intent for us, saying, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. This signifies that our lives have distinct meaning and purpose, rooted in the divine narrative of love, redemption, and relationship with God. So, while the world around us might offer many reasons and explanations for our existence, the Bible firmly states that we were created with intentionality, love, and purpose. The real reason God created you? To know Him, to reflect His image, and to journey through life with a knowledge that you have a unique purpose, ordained from the very beginning of time. Then what is the real reason God created you? Made in God's image. The book of Genesis, which serves as the foundation of the Bible, provides a captivating narrative on the origin of the universe and humanity. It's within this narrative that we encounter a powerful affirmation of our nature and worth. In the beginning, when the universe was but a blank canvas, God, the grand artist, set forth his vision into motion. He painted the skies with stars, adorned the earth with greenery, and filled the oceans with life. Everything was meticulous, everything was beautiful, and everything had its place. Yet among all of creation, there was one masterpiece that held a special place in God's heart. When the time was right, God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 And so, out of the dust of the earth, humanity was crafted. This didn't mean that humans looked exactly like God in a physical sense. Rather, being made in God's image, meant that humans were endowed with qualities that mirrored aspects of God's own nature. They were given the ability to think, to love, to create, to choose, and to connect with one another and with God Himself. Like a mirror reflecting the sun's rays, humans had the potential to reflect the glory, love, and wisdom of their Creator. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the first humans, lived in harmony with nature and had a direct relationship with God. They walked with Him, talked with Him, and lived under His loving guidance. However, the story also teaches us about free will. Though made in His image, Adam and Eve were given the choice to obey or disobey God. Tempted by a serpent, they chose to eat from the forbidden tree, an act that led to consequences, not just for them, but for all of humanity. 
but this is also where God's love shines even brighter. Despite the choices humans made, God never abandoned them. Throughout the Bible, we see that humans, despite their imperfections, have the capacity for greatness. We can create beautiful things, show compassion, strive for justice, and seek wisdom, all of which are reflections of the divine image in which we were created. However, our ability to reflect God's image can sometimes be clouded by our choices and the chaos of life. But the good news is, God's love for His creation is boundless. Through Jesus Christ, God offered a way for humans to restore their relationship with Him. As the Bible says, God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 In essence, being made in God's image is both an honor and a responsibility. It reminds us of our divine origin, our unique purpose, and the love that God has for every one of us. And while we may fail, His grace and love remain constant, inviting us to reflect His image in all we do. We are all like unique pieces of art, made by the greatest artist, God. And just like a painting that reflects the artist's soul, we reflect bits of God's nature in us. We're special, we're loved, and we're always a part of His grand story. Recognizing that we are made in the image of God holds transformative implications for our self-worth and how we perceive others. Every person you meet, regardless of their background, has intrinsic value. They aren't just a product of biological processes, they're a product of divine intention. Knowing this, we are compelled to treat ourselves and others with profound respect and love. It also provides a sense of purpose, steering us towards a life where we can reflect God's character in all we do. In a world often consumed by feelings of insignificance, it's empowering to realize that our very existence is intentional, valuable, and carries divine resonance. We are, in essence, living portraits of God's heart and character, and that truth elevates our purpose and worth in this universe. To have fellowship with Him That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 1, verse 3 In the beginning, there was nothing but God, and then He decided to create a beautiful universe. Let there be light, He said, and there was light. He separated the light from the darkness, creating day and night. Over the course of six days, God crafted the sky, the land, the oceans, plants, animals, and all living creatures. Genesis chapter 1 verses 1 through 25. But God had a special plan in mind. On the sixth day, He created man to have a deep personal relationship with him. Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 through 27. God placed Adam and Eve in a beautiful garden called Eden. There, they had everything they needed to be happy. God often visited them, walking with them in the garden during the cool part of the day. This was a unique relationship unlike any other. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8 God had only one rule for them. 
You can eat the fruit from any tree in the garden, he said, but do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat from it, you will surely die. Genesis chapter 2 verses 16 through 17. However, the serpent in the garden was the embodiment of evil and deception. He tempted Eve, twisting God's words and making her doubt. Tragically, both Eve and Adam ate from the forbidden tree. Genesis chapter 3 verses 1 through 6. This act of disobedience broke their perfect relationship with God. Suddenly, they felt ashamed and hid from him. When God came to the garden, he already knew what had happened, but still called out, Where are you? Genesis chapter 3 verse 9 This wasn't just a question of their location. It was a heartbroken cry, a deep lament for the lost intimacy and trust. Because of their choice, God had to send them away from Eden, but he did not abandon them. He made clothes for them out of animal skins, a gesture of his enduring care and love. Genesis chapter 3 verse 21 Throughout history, God continued to reach out to humanity. He made covenants with people like Noah, Abraham, and Moses, always desiring to be close to us, and always offering his love, guidance, and protection. Even when humans strayed, worshipped other gods, or forgot his teachings, God remained faithful. His heart's desire has always been for us to return to him, to restore that broken relationship from Eden. To bridge this gap, God did something unimaginable. He sent his only son, Jesus, to live among us, to teach us, and ultimately to die for us. Through Jesus' sacrifice, we can now have a direct relationship with God once again, just as Adam and Eve did in Eden. John chapter 3 verse 16 To express dominion and care over creation. At the very beginning of time, God granted humans a special role. He made us stewards or caretakers of the earth its animals, and its resources. To rule over doesn't mean to exploit or harm, but rather to guide, protect, and sustain. Genesis chapter 1 verse 28 reads, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. With love in his eyes, God entrusted Adam and Eve with a special role. This dominion wasn't just power, but a responsibility. God wanted humans to act as stewards, to take care of his beautiful creation, just as a king cares for his kingdom, or a gardener nurtures their garden. But what did it mean to have dominion? Dominion didn't mean to exploit or harm, but to care for and protect. Every tree, every animal, every blade of grass was a testament to God's creativity and love. To harm or destroy any of these creations carelessly was to disregard the love and intention behind them. The story of Eden, the first garden, is a lesson. There, Adam was placed not to merely enjoy its beauty, but to work it and keep it. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 This paints a picture of active engagement of understanding the needs of every plant and creature, of nurturing and ensuring balance and harmony. Sadly, 
as time went on, humanity often forgot its divine role. Instead of stewardship, they often chose greed. Instead of caring, they exploited. Yet God's instruction remained the same. He called upon prophets, teachers, and leaders to remind the people of their duty. In the New Testament, Jesus spoke of love, care, and respect, not just for fellow humans, but for all creation. He admired the lilies in the field and spoke of God's care for every sparrow. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Luke chapter 12 verse 6 this showed the immense value of every creature, big or small, in God's eyes. In essence, God wants us to see the world with eyes of wonder, gratitude, and responsibility. To have dominion is to understand that we are caretakers, meant to safeguard the environment and all its inhabitants. When we act with love and kindness towards all creation, we reflect God's own heart and fulfill our divinely appointed role on this earth. So, the next time you see a butterfly fluttering by or hear the rustle of leaves, remember that it's a piece of God's artwork and we as his children are called to protect, cherish, and celebrate it to reflect His glory. The ultimate reflection of God's glory came in the form of Jesus. Born in humility, Jesus lived a sinless life, teaching about God's love, performing miracles, and pointing everyone back to the Father. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, taking on the weight of our sins, and His resurrection, showcased the immense power and love of God. Through His teachings and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, believers are empowered to reflect God's glory in their lives. Paul, a key figure in the New Testament, talked about transformation and how we can shine with the glory of God. He was one of the most prominent figures in the New Testament, and his life is a testament to the transforming power of God's glory. Here's a concise overview of how Paul reflected the glory of God. Paul, originally known as Saul, was a zealous persecutor of Christians. However, on the road to Damascus, he had a life-altering encounter with Jesus. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Acts chapter 9 verses 3 through 4. This experience changed Saul's life completely. It demonstrated the transformative glory of God, turning a persecutor into one of Christianity's most passionate advocates. After his conversion, Paul dedicated his life to spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Despite facing hardships, his unwavering faith showcased God's glory. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Romans chapter 1 verse 16 Paul endured numerous hardships, beatings, imprisonments, shipwrecks, and more, all for the sake of the gospel. His suffering and resilience reflected God's sustaining glory. I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Galatians chapter 6 verse 17. 
Paul wrote many letters, epistles to various churches, providing guidance, encouragement, and doctrinal clarity. These letters were inspired by the Holy Spirit and reflect God's wisdom and glory. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 Paul emphasized living a life in Christ and being a new creation, which inherently means reflecting God's glory. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 Paul constantly pointed to the sacrifice of Jesus as the ultimate reflection of God's love and glory. He taught that believers should live lives that mirror that sacrifice. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 Overall, Paul's life is a story of transformation, dedication, and love for Jesus. Through his experiences, teachings, and very life, Paul mirrored the glory of God, showing the world the transformative power of God's love and grace. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 To love and serve others When we look at the heart of the Bible, it is clear that God designed us for relationships. Our connection with Him and with those around us paints a vibrant picture of life. At the core of these relationships lies the principle of love and service. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Mark chapter 12 verse 31. Just as we care for our own needs, desires, and well-being, we are called to extend that same care and concern to those around us. Jesus does not suggest, but rather commands, that we make love our default response. It's not a feeling, but an action. While Jesus was teaching, a man asked him, What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The man answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But the man wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Luke chapter 10 verses 25 through 37. To answer this question, Jesus told a story. The parable of the Good Samaritan, based on Luke chapter 10 verses 30 through 37. A man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho when robbers attacked him. They beat him, took his belongings and left him on the side of the road half dead. First, a priest walked by and saw the injured man. Instead of helping, he moved to the other side of the road and continued on his way. Then a Levite, a religious assistant, came by and did the same thing, ignoring the man. But then a Samaritan came along. Now you should know that Jews and Samaritans did not get along. They had differences in beliefs, 
and often avoided each other. But when the Samaritan saw the wounded man, he felt compassion. He went over, cleaned and bandaged his wounds, put him on his own donkey, and took him to an inn. There he cared for him, and even paid the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever you spend beyond this, I'll repay you. Jesus then asked the man, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The man replied, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said, Go and do likewise. From this story, we learn several lessons about how to love and serve others. See the need. The first step in loving and serving others is noticing when they are in need. Don't turn a blind eye. Cross boundaries. Just as the Samaritan helped someone from a different group, we should be willing to help anyone, no matter their background or beliefs. Take action. It's not enough just to feel sorry for someone. The Samaritan took concrete steps to help and so should we. Be generous. The Samaritan didn't just do the bare minimum. He went above and beyond to ensure the injured man was taken care of. In John chapter 13 verses 34 through 35, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This parable, along with Jesus' teachings, emphasizes the importance of actively showing love and kindness to others, serving as a model for how we should live our lives. While we are free in Christ, this freedom isn't meant for self-fulfillment. Instead, it's an invitation to serve others. Service in love is the solution to selfishness. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13 Recall the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples. John chapter 13 verses 1 through 17 In a powerful act of humility, Jesus, the Son of God, washed the feet of his followers. This was a task usually reserved for the lowest of servants. Through this gesture, Jesus showcased that no act of service is too small when done in love. He set the ultimate example. If the master can serve, so can we. A fulfilling life is not one where we chase after our desires. Instead, it is one where we seek the good of others. When we love genuinely and serve selflessly, we reflect God's heart to the world around us. In doing so, we discover profound joy and purpose. For in giving, we truly receive, and in serving, we are uplifted. To fulfill a unique plan and purpose. Throughout the scriptures, it's evident that God, the master planner, has created a unique design for every individual. These plans aren't just broad and generic, but are meticulously designed with specificity and purpose. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 Herein, God assures us of His intentions to bring about prosperity, safety, hope, and a promising future. 
These aren't just comforting words, but promises rooted in the depths of his love. Consider the life of Joseph. Sold into slavery by his brothers, falsely accused and thrown into prison, Joseph might have felt his life was spiraling into randomness. Yet amidst the chaos, God was working on a grander plan. Joseph became the Prime Minister of Egypt, ensuring not only the survival of his family, but also making a way for the Israelites' growth into a great nation. In his words to his brothers, Joseph recognized God's purpose. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Genesis chapter 50 verse 20 Similarly, consider Esther. An ordinary girl turned queen, Esther discovered that her royal position wasn't just an accidental occurrence. It was a divinely appointed role to save her people from destruction. She recognized her purpose when her cousin Mordecai remarked, And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Esther chapter 4 verse 14 Yet these extraordinary plans aren't just limited to biblical figures. They extend to each one of us. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 God crafted each of us with intention, like a potter molds clay into a vessel of purpose. He has prepared tasks, responsibilities, and blessings for every individual. Our lives are not just coincidences or a series of random events. Behind the scenes, God is aligning circumstances, opportunities, and challenges to help us fulfill our purpose. Lessons Understanding our divine purpose gives life meaning and direction. We witness this in the story of the Israelites, a people chosen by God. Though they wandered the desert for 40 years, they were never lost. They were guided by God's presence in the form of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Exodus chapter 13 verse 21 just as the Israelites found purpose in their journey toward the Promised Land, understanding our divine purpose charts the course for our lives. King Solomon was another character in the Bible that knew what it meant to live according to God's design that brings fulfillment and joy. He was one of the wisest men to have ever lived and wrote on his profound reflections on life's meaning. Despite experiencing all the worldly pleasures, he declared, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2 It was only when he centered his life around God's design and purpose that he found genuine satisfaction. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 verse 13 When we align our lives with our Creator's intent, we experience a joy that no worldly treasure can replicate. Yet how can one truly grasp the purpose of God? The invitation is clear. Seek a relationship with God to fully understand and embrace the purpose for which you were created. Jesus, in his teachings, reminded us of the importance of this relationship, stating, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. To know why we were made, we must know our Maker. From the very beginning with Adam and Eve, he has wanted nothing more than to be close to us. Even when we make mistakes, 
His arms remain open, always ready to embrace and guide us back to Him. God desires a close, personal relationship with each of us. The essence of this verse in 1 John is clear. God wants to be in fellowship with us. It's not about a distant God watching from afar, but a loving Father wanting to be involved in our daily lives. Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. James chapter 4 verse 8 This verse reminds us that the step towards closeness with God is mutual. As we take steps towards Him, He takes steps towards us. Given this understanding, it is then logical that the core of our existence should revolve around knowing and loving God. This doesn't mean we abandon our earthly responsibilities, but it means our actions, decisions, and priorities are influenced by our relationship with God. To have a fellowship with God, pray regularly. Like any relationship, communication is key. Prayer is our direct line to God. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 17. Read his word. The Bible is God's written communication to us. Through it, we understand his character, his love, and his plans. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm chapter 119 verse 105. Seek community. Join with others who are also seeking to know and love God. This shared journey strengthens our relationship with God and with each other. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Matthew chapter 18 verse 20. Obey his commands. Love for God is expressed through obedience to His commands. As we align our lives with His will, we deepen our fellowship with Him. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. John chapter 14 verse 15 Share His love Being in fellowship with God also means sharing His love and good news with others. This is a natural outcome of a life centered around knowing and loving God. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Having fellowship with God is about aligning our hearts, minds, and lives with His will. As we take steps toward Him, He draws closer to us fulfilling the deepest longings of our soul and offering a relationship like no other. In conclusion, as we navigate the journey of life, let's remain connected to the assurance that God has a unique plan and purpose for each of us. Our task is to partner with Him in faith and obedience to witness the unfolding of these divine plans. Our lives are intentional, and in God's blueprint, we each have good works to accomplish. Prayer Heavenly Father, the giver of life and the author of our stories, today we come before you, seeking the profound truths about our existence. We recognize that in your infinite wisdom and boundless love, you shaped us, not by accident or chance, but with intention and purpose. Lord, enlighten our minds and hearts to grasp the real reason you created each one of us. Remind us that we are not mere wanderers on this earth, but are here to reflect your image, to love as you love, to serve as Jesus served, and to shine your light in every corner of our lives. Help us, O oh God, 
to see past the distractions and noises of this world. Lead us into a deeper understanding of our true purpose, so that we might embrace it fully and walk in it confidently. May we always remember that we are designed by you and that every talent, every passion, every moment has a divine reason. Stir up in us the fire to pursue the calling you have placed in our hearts, to touch lives, to make a difference, and to glorify your name. May we live each day with gratitude, recognizing that our very breath is a testament to your plan for us. Guide us to utilize every moment, every opportunity, to showcase your love and grace. Thank you, Father, for your grand design, for crafting each one of us uniquely and wonderfully. Instill in us the assurance that we are here for a reason, a reason far greater than we could ever imagine. In Jesus' name we pray.